Alright folks, chapter 2, basic switching concepts. Now, your, P, your switch, I'm sorry, your switch is just like a PC. Um, when it boots up, it does a power on self check, so it does a post. Checks to make sure it has a CPU, does it have RAM, does it have flash, that kind of stuff. Then there's a little ROM chip, and on the ROM chip is the bootloader. So the bootloader is accessed, um, and the, the bootloader program says, hey, this is the program that's going to tell you how, where to go next. And the bootloader then points to the flash card. Excuse me. And then on the flash card, you have the iOS, uh, Cisco's Internet Operating System, or Internet Work Operating System, depending on what book you read. So the bootloader then points to the flash card. And on the flash card is the iOS, and then it loads it. So uh, picture the flash card kind of like a, a mini hard drive on the switch. Uh, and then your hard drive has your Windows operating system. All right, so the iOS loads. Whoop, got all excited there. So as the iOS loads, then it needs a configuration file. So it goes to the NVRAM. So remember, NVRAM is non-volatile RAM. Um, it, it's stored on the motherboard. It's probably powered through a CMOS battery or the little battery thing like that. So that when you shut the switch off, it does not lose its information. So on the NVRAM, if there's a file there, a configuration file, it's called the startup configuration. And the startup configuration is then, if it's there, uh, it's copied into the regular RAM or the DRAM. All right, and then it's it's called the running configuration. So, in other words, the the, con the startup configuration to NVRAM is copied into RAM, and then it's called the N or the the running configuration. If there is no startup configuration, the PC boots right into RAM and it goes into a, um, a configuration wizard and says, you know, do you want to auto configure the switch? And remember, in our class, we don't auto configure because you auto not auto configure. So the big thing is there are three types of memory in the router um, flash, NVRAM, uh, and then regular RAM. The flash memory holds the iOS, the operating system. The NVRAM holds the startup configuration, and then the regular RAM holds the running configuration. When you're making changes to the router, you're actually changing the running configuration in RAM. So that when you're done, if you don't save it to NVRAM, uh, and then you power cycle the router, you actually lose your changes. Um, and that happens in labs uh, with students a lot. And then there's a simple command, you know, copy, run, start, which copies the running configuration back to the starting configuration, and then you're all set. And we'll get into that when we start playing with the routers and switches. All right, so um, first we're going to talk about the, um, the show version command, because it has a lot of information on it. All right, so here I am in Packet Tracer. Hopefully you've downloaded this at home and you have access to it. Um, if you do, you know, pause the video and grab a 2811 router um, and open up Packet Tracer. And then we're going to open this up. All right, now you can see um, it says, do you want to uh, continue with configuration dialog? So this is the auto configuration wizard. And you want obviously you want to answer no. So whenever you see that, it means that there was either A, there was no uh, startup configuration. There was nothing in the NVRAM. So it had to ask you, hey, do you want to auto configure? Or it means the configuration register was changed so that your uh, router or switch started up and skipped that. And I'm going to show you what that is in just a second. All right, so we're going to go in, enable, and we're going to do show version, so show VER. Now, once we get through all the blah, blah, blah exporting rules, uh, wait for it. All right, here we go. So here's the information. So here's the processor on the board. Here's there's two interfaces. Uh, there's how much NVRAM, how much flash memory, and why am I not seeing the regular memory? Hold on a sec. All right, apparently they've, they've changed packet tracer a little bit, so now it kind of splits this up. But let me show you. So I do show version. Um, one, it's going to show me the name of the file that was used. So in this case, in the flash, you see the configuration file is actually named this. Now, eventually we'll get into and talk about, you know, obviously this is the router model number, this is the advanced IP services pack, and then this is the, the version number, 12.4.15, blah, and it's always a binary file. Um, it also shows you that the version of the bootstrap. Uh, and then this stuff all gets interjected in the middle, and then it shows you the memory. So here on this 1841, um, it shows you how much is in the regular memory, 
how much is in NVRAM, and then how much is in the flash. Now, with the NVRAM and flash, it shows you the amount. So one, you know, 191K of NVRAM. Again, you only have a small text file in there called the startup config, so it doesn't have to be very big. And then here on the flash card, you're typically only storing the iOS file uh, and maybe a couple configuration files. Now, if you're doing voice over IP, you're going to put a bigger flash card in there because you're going to have more files, but we'll get into that in some other class. Now, here's the one that's weird. It's the regular memory. When you look at the, the memory configuration here on the switch, what it does is it gives you two different numbers. The first one is how much is free. The second number is how much is being used by the regular RAM. So you'll have to add these two numbers up to get the total amount of RAM. So how much is free, how much is used, so total RAM, um, and then NVRAM and flash. Now the last one here is the configuration register. The configuration register is a hexadecimal number, so that's why it says 0x, so 2102. And you can change this number to change how the uh, router operates. For example, 2102 means start the router normally uh, and use the startup file. So if there is a startup file in the, in the NVRAM, use it. But if you change this number to 2142, uh, it then skips the startup file. Now, that's commonly used to get past uh, password issues. So let me give an example. Um, let's say, you know, Joe Donut is the network administrator somewhere. He's been there for like 10 years. He knows all the router passwords by heart, so he never wrote them down anywhere. And then he leaves. And then you come in. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're having a problem with this router. Uh, and you go in and look, and all of a sudden you can't get into it because you don't know the password. So you call Joe Donut at his new job, and then he laughs at you and hangs up the phone. So you don't want to lose all the configuration information on the router, so what you can do is you can actually boot the router up, hit control break, um, go into ROM mod mode, and change the configuration register to 2142. And then it doesn't load that configuration file, it just puts you into the, um, the, the RAM. And then in the RAM you can get past all the passwords, you know, you go to enable to go to the next mode, um, config T, and, and then, then you load, you know, copy, start, run, move that configuration over, and now you're already past the passwords. So then you can change it. So that's why that's there. So remember, 2102 is normal operation, use the startup file. 2142 skips the startup file, and it's typically used for uh, password resets. Sorry about that. All right, so back to the switch. You know, ports on a switch are physical ports, and we call them switch ports. Um, some people suggest that they're called switch ports because they switch the send and receive for you so that you can use a straight through cable. Um, but we call them switch ports. We don't assign IP addresses to these physical ports. So with a switch port, you don't assign an IP address to it. We assign an IP address to a virtual um, switch port, so a switch virtual interface, um, like a VLAN. Uh, so we can create VLAN 99, and then we assign an IP address to VLAN 99. And then when we need to manage the switch, we can then access that IP address, and we can manage the switch. So you don't want to set an IP address on the physical ports. Um, there's no need to, because the basically when your PC plugs into a switch, you're, you're kind of routing through the switch, and then the switch is a, it's a, kind of like a, a traffic cop that kind of decides where it kind of goes from there. But he doesn't need an IP address. He only needs an IP address if you want to remote into the switch to do stuff. And then if that's the case, you actually assign it to a VLAN. So you would go to VLAN 99, make it the management interface, assign an IP address, and then that's the switch virtual interface. All right. So again, if you did it, if you went into uh, Packet Tracer, you went to Global Mode, you would just type in Interface VLAN 99, Enter IP space address space the IP address you want to give it space the subnet mask, and then do No Shut, um, and then you're going to be good. Now we use VLAN 99 for management in this class, uh, but in the real world you may use a different one because 99 is kind of common. All right. So if you um, set up the web interface on your switch and you uh, put an IP address on there, um, you can get a GUI, a graphical user interface, to come up. And this is how, I, I guess, more efficient um, IT departments make changes to their, their switch. So imagine this. You know, you've got one company, and whenever you know, PC A is going to move from room A to room B, um, the tech comes in, and he writes down the jack number, he takes the PC, and then he moves it to room B, uh, and then he plugs everything in, and then he writes down the new jack number, then he goes into the wiring closet. So when he goes into the wiring closet, you know, it may be a 15-foot cable or a 6-foot cable um, from the old 
where where the, where the old plug was. But the new plug may only be a foot away from, so you only may, you may go from needing six foot of cable to needing one foot of cable. So he just uses that cable over, and then there's like three foot of cable hanging down. So basically, you end up getting these big uh, spaghetti issues in your closet. Now, some place that's more organized will do something like this, where they have a switch port for every patch panel port. So what happens when, this, when the, the tech wants to move PCA to PCB, everything's normal. He still writes down the jack numbers. But when he's ready, he then calls the network guy and says, hey, I need you to turn off this port and turn on this port. And then the network guy just comes in here and clicks the port and says, okay, turn off, clicks this port, turn on. And then there, there is no moving of cables. Um, you know, whenever you move cables, there's always a chance you're going to break the tips off as you're pulling them through other cables. Um, if you're trying to match them up to a switch and a patch panel, uh, it's never going to be the right size. Uh, and then you're going to get spaghetti messes uh, and all kinds of stuff like that. So again, most organized places have something like this where they're using the web interface. Uh, and again, you can also use it to you know to monitor the switch. Is the temperature okay? Is the fan working? Um, how much data am I passing? That kind of stuff. All right, default gateway. Your switch may need a default gateway, and if it does, you just go into global mode, so config T, and do IP space default gateway space 192.168.1.1 space, and then you're in. And again, if you need your switch to point to you know a certain router or something, you know if he doesn't know where a packet goes, um, then that's how you can set the default gateway. All right, so some basic commands, you know, show interface will show you a whole page of information for each interface. Um, and again, as we're doing these commands, you may want to have Packet Tracer open so you can type these in. So your show commands are typically from privilege mode. Um, but if you're in global mode, you can put the word do in front of it, and then you can do it. So in global mode, it's do show int. Um, in privilege mode, it's just show int. So again, show int gives you an entire page for each interface. So it gives you very detailed information. But if you've got 12 interfaces, you get 12 pages of data. Um, show IP interface brief gives you the brief chart and shows you, you know, here's the interface you have, here's their IP addresses, then here's their status. And then if you want to see the MAC address table or the CAM, it's just show MAC-address-table um, or MAC address table. Uh, so it depends on what version of the iOS you're running. Um, sometimes there's this dash here, sometimes there's not. All right, remember half duplex is like a, a walkie-talkie. You know, um, you can only send or receive at the same time. You can't do both. Um, full duplex is what most of us are running now. And remember, with full duplex, there are no collisions. Um, we can send and receive at the same time. So just because you're receiving data doesn't mean you can't send data. So again, there are no collisions. All right, now here's the important part. A switch port tries to negotiate full duplex with whatever it connects to. So that's the default. Um, by default, the switch port is set to auto configuration. And he automatically tries to do full duplex. If for some reason something happens and some packets are dropped or that signal is interrupted or your NIC card doesn't quite understand or they don't talk correctly, or whatever it is, if for some reason that negotiation fails, the switch will then default to half duplex. So then you are prone to collision. So if you ever get in your switch and you see duplex mismatch, that's a probably what happened. Either A, you're connected to a NIC card that only does half duplex, which I hope that you never run into that issue, because um, even nowadays that's kind of odd, or the negotiation failed. Um, so that's why it's very important, typically in our networks, to set things um, ourselves and don't use these auto configuration things. So just be aware, um, full duplex gives you like 200% of the bandwidth because you can send and receive at the same time. So if I have a thousand port switch, you know, a Cat5 cable, you know, I can send at a thousand and I can receive at a thousand. So that's 2,000 megabits per second that I need to go through the switch. If I have a 24 port switch and it's all Cat6, so it's 24,000 times 24 or 24,000 times 2, so I actually need to get 48,000 megabits per second to go through that back plane of the switch if everybody is on and running full speed at the same time. Um, so again, that's why it's very important to look at the, at the, the throughput of the switch, how much it can handle. All right. So to configure these things manually, you know, from global mode, you go into the interface. So interface FA02, enter, and then duplex full, enter, speed 100, enter, um, and then end. Um, and again, and that way you won't have these duplex mismatches. Um, so remember, your options are like full, half, and auto. And by default, it's set for auto duplex. 
All right. One thing I want to note: um, MIDX is just media, or sorry, medium in or media medium <laughs> dependent interface crossover. And all that means is there used to be, um, if you wanted to do a, a straight through cable between a PC and a hub, there was this little MDIX little switch that you hit um, that would kind of cross the stuff over for you. Um, by default on the 2960 and above switches um, that's set for on so it'll cross over for you so you can go from switch to switch with a straight through cable um, but it was not available on the 2950 so if you want to connect a 2950 switch to another 2950 switch you have to use a crossover cable but on the 2960s and above you can use straight through cables uh, because it will automatically switch those for you but on your Ooh, what the? Sorry, I got timed out of Angel. On your exams, a certification exams or anything, anytime you're going from two of the same things, switch to switch, NIC card to NIC card, it's always a crossover cable. Even though in the real world it's not always that case, like switch to switch with the 2960s, the straight through will work. Um, on exams and certification exams, it's always switch to switch, crossover cable. On your labs, switch to switch, crossover cable. All right. So when I do the show interface, I get a bunch of information. So show interface, hey, fast Ethernet zero one is up. Here's the MAC address. Um, here's the transmission load. Excuse me, and then the the receiving load. Um, it's in full duplex mode. Uh, then there's runs, giants. You know, runs are small packets, giants are big packets, um, that kind of stuff. But you'll notice for the switch, it uses the same MAC address, but just changes the last two numbers. So this is port one. So port two would still be zero zero e zero, you know, a three d one b e, but then it would be zero two. And that way you can kind of follow along to see which port you're on uh, by the MAC address. So if it says b e twelve, then you know you're on port twelve. All right, so what does it mean again? Um, the MAC address is the, is the MAC address assigned to the switch port. Um, while the switch ports are not assigned IP addresses, they are assigned MAC addresses. All right, load again is, is how much the transmit and receive load is on the medium. Duplex, the duplex setting. Runt is a packet that's too small. Um, any packet smaller than 64 bytes is dropped. Um, giant is a packet that's too big to handle. Uh, by default, the message transmit unit size, the maximum, I believe, is 1522 on Ethernet. Um, it's typically set for 1500. But if a packet comes in that's, too, that's bigger than 1522, um, it would be dropped as a giant. All right, again, um, CFC errors um, are just found, you know, when doing error checking. Uh, collisions, you know, how many ha packets had to be retransmitted due to a collision. And then a late collision is a collision after 512 bits have been received. Um, and typically it's a result of excessive cable lengths. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right, troubleshooting. So when troubleshooting intermittent problems or slowdowns in the corporation networks, um, Show INT can show you that, or give you some help in, uh, in finding those. One, how many collisions am I having? Am I having a lot of collisions? Why? You know, what is sending? Is somebody broadcasting too much? Uh, and then excessive load. Is somebody, you know, transmitting or receiving too much? Maybe a NIC card is freaking out and it's just broadcasting automatically. Uh, is there a duplex mismatch? Is it set for half duplex for some reason? And then why? Um, is it the wrong speed type? You know, is it a, a, a thousand meg speed? Is a Cat6 cable um, with a Cat6 NIC card, but somebody set it for 100? Um, or am I getting you know CFC errors? For some reason, are the packets being damaged? Maybe you have a bad NIC card, um, and he just creates bad packets. Um, so, all a lot of those issues can be found just by doing the show interface command. All right. Managing the switch, you can manage it a couple different ways. Um, typically, when it's a brand new switch, you pull it out of the box and you put it on your desk, and you stick a console cable into it, and then you do the basic configuration. So I put the console cable in, go through the console line, you know, I give it an IP address, stuff like that. So once I do the IP address, then I can put it in the network, so I, I rack mount it, um, and then I can actually telnet from a network cable to the IP address. So you can telnet from the console cable locally, or you can telnet to an IP address. Or maybe I've set it up for SSH and I'm going to um, access it through the, the GUI. So, so just make sure you know, obviously, Telnet is port 23, um, SSH is port 22. So you'll have to have those open. All right. Now, with SSH, again, now you're doing, you know, a secure shell uh, connection. Um, so there has to be, you know, IP addresses, I'm sorry, usernames and passwords and stuff like that. So to create it, 
If you want to check first to make sure your switch supports SSH, do the show IP SSH command. If that command is unrecognized, your switch does not support SSH. Either your uh, operating system doesn't support it um, because it maybe you know it's a basic version or uh, it's just uh, your switch is old. All right, so first thing you have to do is configure a domain name. So you know IP domain name, and then it can be whatever you want, class.com, um, that kind of stuff. Then you got to configure the crypto key. So crypto key generate RSA. Then you got to configure a username and password. So username Joe, password Cisco. Then you got to configure the lines, you know, line VTY 0 space 15 because you want to do all 16 lines. And then configure SSH login. Transport input SSH, enter, and then login local. And you're all set. So to put this all together, let's say I'm, I'm doing a, a configuration on a switch. Um, first thing I want to do is host name. So, you know, host name, you know, whatever name of the switch. So switch one. And then I want to do enable secret. So enable secret Cisco. Um, then I want to do passwords on the console and the telnet. So remember, whenever we do um, passwords in class or we set up the console or the telnet lines, it's always four commands. Password Cisco, enter. Login, enter. Login synchronous, enter. Exec timeout 30 space zero, enter. All right, and then banner message of the day. So anytime we say, you know, put a basic configuration on a switch or a router, this is what we're talking about. Host name, passwords, banner. All right, then to put an IP address on the switch, we want to go to the, the, the switch virtual interface. So, you know, VLAN 99, enter, um, IP space address, blah, blah, blah. And then if we want to do a default gateway from global mode, it's just um, IP space default dash gateway space, you know, the, whatever the IP address you're using. And then to set up SSH or to allow SSH, you know, domain name, um, username, um, and then password, and you're all set. All right, now switch security. All kinds of issues with switches. Um, one, back in the old days, um, your MAC address table could only hold so much. Um, the fields were only so big. So what they would do is they would flood the MAC address table with a whole bunch of MAC addresses. And once that MAC address table got filled, then it would like, oh, the, the switch would kind of go into a panic mode, and then it would start broadcasting things and do bad stuff. So nowadays, you know, is, we don't really have these buffer overflow attacks. You know, your 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 most of your switches can handle a lot of the stuff. They know what to do if they're getting too many, that kind of thing. So it's not really a big issue now, but especially on older switches, that that's an issue. All right, um, DHCP spoofing. You know, somebody sets up like a, they're a fake DHCP server because um, they want to give you bad information, like maybe a bad DNS uh, information, so that when you go to firstmerit.com, you're actually going to their website. Um, so your book talks about using trusted ports. Uh, denial of service attacks, um, you know, to try to deny functions like Telnet. You know, if they've got, you know, several thousand PCs all hammering your Telnet port, uh, you may not be able to get in there. All right, and then CDP, a Cisco Discovery Protocol. Remember, all Cisco devices um, have CDP by default. It's a layer two protocol um, where the, the devices discover their neighboring devices and they discover IP addresses, model numbers, things like that. You typically don't want that on, especially at your border network. Because you don't want the internet or the attacker to be able to do CDP and see like what model numbers of routers and switches you have, because um, again, then he would kind of he he would have a better idea of what kind of attacks to use. Uh, inside your network, uh, it's up to you. Um, a lot of people leave it on. Uh, it all depends. You know, if you're just in a manufacturing environment, leave it on. It's no big deal. But if you're in, you know, I don't know, banking, then you probably want to typically have CDP turned off. So just remember, you know, CDP is enabled by default, and that you at least at minimum want to disable it at your border. All right, your security plan is like an onion. It should be layered. Uh, there is no one-size-fits-all. Um, so each one has to be tailored to the organization and what it's trying to accomplish. Um, the, the, the easiest mythology to follow is to allow the good rather than try to block the bad. You know, it's easier to, you know, well, let's say you want to start blocking the Internet. Um, it's easier to go out and say, hey, you know, all the departments, you know, I need a list from you of what websites you need to go to, um, and then to program that in. You know, even if there's 200 websites you got to program in, um, and then obviously, you know, the first time you implement it, there's going to be some issues. Uh, oh, we forgot this site, we forgot this site, but that's all minor. It's easier to do that than it is to try to block all the bad stuff because bad stuff is new every day. Um, you know, just think about how many new porn sites uh, go online a week. So, again, it's easier to allow the good than block the bad. All right, there should be a written type or a written plan for each type of hardware. You know, here's the plan for firewalls. Here's the basic security that has to be on there. Here's the basic security that has to be on for a router, that kind of stuff. 
All right, strong passwords. You should have strong passwords. They shouldn't be easy. They shouldn't just be names, that kind of stuff. Most security can be broken. You know, WEP is easy to break. WEP one, or I'm sorry, WPA one, WPA two. All of it, the hash can be grabbed. But it doesn't matter if they grab the hash if the password is very strong. You know, with WPA2, you can use WPA2 on the wireless, and I can grab your hash in probably less than a couple minutes. But how long would it take me to break that hash, the, pa the hashed password? If you've got a strong password on there, you know, I'll never break it. So strong passwords, typically phrases, you know, I love money dollar signs, something like that. Uh, you typically want them to be over eight characters. You know, the more characters, the better, and the more words and different characters in there, the better. So we like phrases. Um, anything's, we look, tend to push things over 16 characters. Uh, that way they're nice and big. All right. You want to control physical access to your equipment. You know, most wiring closets, for some reason, are placed on the other side of a bathroom wall. So if you're in like a medical facility, somebody goes in the bathroom, then they just climb over the ceiling tiles in your wiring closet. Um, so you've got to make sure that your physical equipment um, is not accessible, you know, either through going, somebody going over the cinder block, through the drop ceiling or something like that, or then make sure all the doors are locked. All right, backups. Where do you have your backups stored? Are they on-site? Are they off-site? You know, if you just pull out the tape and put it right there on the shelf that's right in the same server room, and your server room catches fire, you've lost all your data because your tape and the server melted. So, you know, minimum, it, it should be moved to another side of the building. Uh, your backup tapes, um, best case scenario, you should have some kind of off-site storage, uh, and there should be some kind of plan. You know, even if it's, you know, the CEO takes a tape home every month or something like that. Um, but if somebody takes the tape home and not, you know, somewhere secure, uh, you've also got to have issues because, you know, what if your wife throws the tape out uh, and then somebody grabs it in the trash and then somebody ac accesses the data? Uh, so be aware of that. All right, employee education. Where do we spend our money for security? Um, typically, we spend it at our perimeter. We're trying to keep the bad guys out. But the truth is, a lot of bad guys are already inside our network. So, and a lot of the bad guys are our employees. So we need to educate our employees. You know, don't give out passwords, do this, do that, that kind of thing. How they can be secure and keep their passwords safe. Uh, we need to do audits. You know, we need to go through things and check to see if things are happening, not wait until uh, after it happened. Uh, one example, if you're going through the logs, you can actually see somebody. You know, let's say Joe Donut is trying to access somebody's uh, username and password. So every day he tries three or four attempts. So he tries three attempts and locks them out, uh, and then every 15 minutes he can do that again. Well, if he does that for a couple weeks, maybe he gets lucky and guesses the password, and then he gets into the HR files. And then you find out, so, but if you were looking at the, the, the logs and you were doing your weekly audits, you would see, hey, how come every week this guy is, is typing in, is trying to access this user account? Why is he being denied this? And then you, can, you, you could stop it right there. All right, last thing is unused services. There's a lot of old services like Boot P that was like the predecessor to DHCP, um, Finger, just some weird stuff out there that's still on or turned on these routers and switches by default um, just because of old legacy systems that they need, might need to interoperate with. But if you're not using that service, you probably want to turn that off. All right. So first thing you should do is disable unused ports. And you can disable them by a whole range. So, you know, go into global mode, interface, space range, space FA0-1, um, space dash, space the next number. So this will actually activate ports 1 through 12. And that way when you're on a switch, especially like a 48 port switch, excuse me, you can do, um, you know, 48 ports at a time. So in this case, let's say you want to disable ports 1 through 12, you just, you know, do this, and then hit shut down and you're all good. All right, for ports on the DHCP server, so if, if the DHCP server is there, um, you want to set up uh, DHCP uh, snooping. So IP DHCP snooping, snooping uh, VLAN 10, the interface, and then, and then IP DHCP snooping trust. And then all other ports should be untrusted. Uh, and that way nobody else is pushing out fake IP addresses on your network. All right, port security. Here's where it gets kind of weird. 
we don't typically see this in, in regular networks, especially in class. Um, but you can set up your port to allow only certain MAC addresses to attach. Now, in the banking industry, this is huge, and they're typically set up with this. Now, you can have it grab MAC addresses um, statically, meaning you typed in the MAC addresses that are allowed. You can do it dynamically and let have it learn the, like the, the the first ten MAC addresses, but nothing after that. Or you can have it do sticky and have it learn those MAC addresses as they attach, um, and kind of keep them there. So we'll talk about each one individually. So static MAC address, um, you know, um, they're saved in the running configuration in the CAM. So if you do a copy run start, it'll still be active when you reboot the switch. So it's important to remember that um, the if you do a static MAC it's saved in the running configuration and the cam. So if you reboot, remember the cam gets wiped, but if you did a copy run start, it'll still be active when you reboot. So to do it, you just from sub interface mode, so I went to an interface, you know, interface FA00, uh, or I'm sorry, 01, and then switch port, port security, enter, and then switch port, port security, MAC address, and then you type in the MAC address manually. So again, in the banking industry, my understanding is they use this pretty heavily. All right, dynamic. This is the way uh, the, the CAM normally works. So we store addresses in the CAM, and a reboot clears those. Uh, they're not stored in the configuration file at all. It's not secure. There's no command for this. This is the default operation. So basically, any time a PC connects, his MAC address is learned dynamically um, on the port, and then it's forwarded to him You know when something comes for his traffic. Um, but that's it. When we reboot, it gets wiped. All right, sticky is a way to keep the addresses in there. So sticky, stickies, sticky, sticky wiggy. Anyway, stickies are stored in the running configuration and the cam. Um, so again, if somebody does a copy or run start and saves the configuration, then the sticky stuff will still be remembered. All right. So again, um, you know, from the switch port, you know, or from the port. So interface FA02 enter. Switch port port security enter. Switch port port security MAC address sticky, and sticky just says, "Hey, I'll remember the MAC address that was plugged in here." So that's a way that you can have it where you, know, you can just plug, plug the PCs in, and it'll learn those addresses automatically without you having to write down all the MAC addresses um, and then try to figure out which port they're connected to. All right, now some additional commands. How many MA uh, addresses do you want it to learn? Uh, do you want it to learn one? Do you want it to learn ten? So can ten different MAC addresses access that port? So whatever it is, you know, switch port, port security, enter, and then switch port, port security, maximum fifty, and that would learn fifty addresses. And then what to do when a violation occurs? What happens when that fifty-first MAC address tries to get into uh, that port? So your options are protect, restrict, and shut down. And to turn that on, it's just you know, switch port, port security, enter and then switch port, port security, violation, and then whatever you want the violation to do. So protect, restrict, or shut down. Now protect. When the max is reached, any unknown ad MAC addresses are not allowed, so they're dropped. Uh, so they're not allowed to communicate. And no notification is sent to you know, the administrator. If it's on restrict, it's the same thing. Um, any unknown addresses after the, the max is hit um, is dropped but a notification message is sent to the administrator and you can have that sent several different ways and then shut down um, if a violation occurs the port gets shut down so protect you know just drop all the other anything over port like let's say you set your maximum of 50 the 51st guy tries to connect when he connects it drops his packets but the first 50 MAC addresses are still able to operate on that port and no notification is sent. With restrict, again, 50 guys can still work. The 51st guy is removed and he's never used uh, and not allowed to transmit on their network. Um, and a notification is sent. But with shutdown, when somebody violates the policy, so the 51st guy connects, the entire port is shut down and nobody can transmit. Uh, typically, you see that in the banking industry. All right, so if I was doing it all together, it would be something like this. You know, go to config T, so go to global mode, interface FA01, enter, switch port mode access to make it an access port, enter, switch port port security, enter, switch port port security maximum 10, switch port port security violation shutdown, switch port, um, sw switch port port security, MAC address, and then the MAC address to do a static, or I could do switch port port security, MAC address sticky, or I can do both. 
switch port, port security, MAC address, sticky, and then put a static one on top of it. So I'm going to learn 10 addresses. They're all going to be learned sticky except for the first one that I'm going to put in manually. So it would sticky 9 and then use 1 statically. Woo! That was a lot. All right, so your commands, the show command, so show port security will show you, you know, your port numbers, um, how many addresses they have learned, and then what the action is. So which ones, uh, what, what are they set for when a violation occurs? All right, switch port or shows uh, port security interface FA01. So now if you want to look at a specific port, you can put that in, and it would show you know, that it, it's enabled, it's secure up, um, what happens if it's violated, it's in shutdown, that kind of thing, how many addresses are the max, how many addresses has it learned so far, that kind of thing. All right, show port security addresses. Um, we'll show you the table, um, all the MAC addresses it has learned, what ports it's learned them on, things like that. All right, to remove port security, you just do no switch port port security, and that will remove the port settings on there, or no switch port port security MAC address sticky, um, if you just want to remove the sticky part. So now remember, it removes the entries from the running config, but not the cam. So when you do that, you still have to reboot the router to clear the cam um, if you want to turn off port security for some reason. Otherwise, those addresses are just removed from the running configuration, so they're not saved if you do a copy run start but they would still be in your regular RAM, so you'd have to reboot. All right, and then last, um, NTP is Network Time Protocol. Most organizations have something set up so that all their devices are on the same time. Uh, and that way, when something happens, it's easier to track. You know, if your wireless access point is off by two minutes, and the router's off by a minute and 40 seconds, and the server's off by, you know, three minutes, uh, when you're looking at the logs, you don't have to add all this time in, which is a pain in the butt to do, by the way. If all your logs are the, are, if all your time settings are the same, um, you can track things through your network a lot easier. So basically, what happens is, you know, there are NTP time servers out on the internet. So you have one server in your organization that's at the NTP server, and he goes out and he uh, always adjusts his time to that time. And then all the other devices are all set to um, point to your server. And that way, all your devices aren't accessing the internet and sucking up bandwidth going to this NTP server. So again, to set it up, you know, NTP space server space blah 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 blah. The IP address, you know, if it's going out to the internet, it'd be an internet address. If it's going to somewhere internally, it'd go there. Um, to configure the master, you know, NTP master one. So if no number is given, then H used. Um, and then if you want to check it out, just show NTP associations or show NTP status. Um, again, in class we typically do this where we point to an internet NTP server um, and just to, to suck to get our time. But in the real world, they typically have one NTP server up that gets the information from the internet, uh, maybe even two for backup, um, and then everything goes off of those servers, and that way all the devices, their times are the same. All right, so to wrap it up, you know your lab this week, you, um, you're going to set up port security uh, and SSH connectivity um, on a switch. Uh, you should have a section of notes for each of these topics. Uh, and don't forget to do the assessment on uh, Chapter 2 on the Academy. Remember, every week you have an assessment on the Academy. Every week you've got a quiz, you've got a lab, and you've got an assessment on the Academy. They're all due Sunday at midnight for each week. So the week that we cover Chapter 2, it's due that Sunday night. The week we cover Chapter 3, it's due that Sunday night. So you get the idea. All right, so remember, if you have questions about this stuff, um, bring it up in class. Uh, remember, as you're watching through the video, you should have Packet Tracer up. Pause the video and then do the commands, uh, and that way you're familiar with them. Take notes, and you should be good. Um, don't forget, pop quizzes in class. You can use your notes, um, so you are rewarded for bringing notes in. All right, guys, see you in class.